We can go ahead and get started. I'm going to move a little bit quick because I'm going to try and get us back on track for the timing. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me. Just shout it out, whatever. We'll deal with it. Um, this is an introductory level class, right? So if you already do any kind of mobile reverse engineering, you're going to be a little bit bored, so just deal with it. Um, welcome to Hacking Mobile Apps with Frida also known as Hacking Mobile Apps with Frida and all the other tools that are based on Frida, which don't always tell you. So <laughs> as we'll go through this, you'll see why I'm calling it that, because basically Frida is like the, the magical framework at the very bottom. Um, it is not turtles all the way down. Frida is what makes the magic happen. So sometimes people want to know a little bit about <laughs> me. So this is my general career path to get into being a pen tester. Right now, I am the pen test lead for Allstate Insurance. Um, I've been doing AppSec pen testing for maybe five years, something like that. Um, but before that, I did Blue Team Engineering and then just a lot of random stuff to get here, right? And so half of the people are always wondering about the speaker, and half of the other people are like, what the hell are we doing here? So what makes me the person to present to talk about reverse engineering mobile apps? Um, first of all, I am not a wizard, right? I struggled through these over the past year and learned a few tricks, and I feel the thing that I can really impart to people who are just picking this up is where I failed miserably and beat my head on the keyboard for weeks on end trying to get through very small problems and watching people online that are just like, oh, yeah, you just do this and run that command, and it doesn't work, right? But you're more like Clippy, so, right? Yeah, I'm like Clippy. So... Um, now everybody else is thinking, that's great. What are we doing here? So everybody generally gets into mobile app, app hacking through the same sort of path, right? People always start with traffic analysis. The first thing you want to do is hook it up to Burp Suite. Um, that's the only proxy that we accept around here. So <laughs> the apps, most of them, unless you're doing some really basic stuff, are going to make API calls out to the internet, right? They got to call home to do almost everything. And even the ones that are doing basic stuff are calling out for ads and malware and whatever else you run on your dirty phones. Um, so this is where everybody really starts. You can get into modifying the API calls, changing parameters, basically the same thing as you would with like a normal web pen test um, with a mobile phone. A lot of the apps that we see are just web views anyway, so it's basically just a browser running on your phone, and they called it an app. Right. The next natural place most people go is configuration analysis. But this is something that's done typically for professional pen testers and people who are trying to secure an app as much as possible. You're going to look for the, the check boxes, the configuration, the build config, the, the secure data storage, things like that, all the Apple NS URL garbage. Um, you're going to go through there and give a report to some developer. Maybe they'll do something, maybe they won't. So configuration analysis is, is pretty dry, and there's not much to do. There's a couple good tools I'll show later to speed that up, but that's not why we're here. Um, if you're doing this professionally, the next place you naturally go is static analysis, right? If you work for a company that makes mobile apps, then you can get the source code that they wrote it with. If you don't, and you're just trying to learn this on your own at home with Clash of Clans, then you're going to be decompiling that and trying to find either the assembly or maybe you're rich and you can get Ida Pro and get like the ARM <laughs> decompiler. Um, <laughs> Anyone in here ever use Ida Pro? A little bit? <coughs> it helps a lot. Um, so typically for a professional pen tester, for people, for people who are just learning, that's where most people stop. That's kind of the, the end, and you're just like, OK, I'm, I'm done, so I can give my report to the dev team and move on to the next app on Monday. <coughs> right? So everybody in this room knows that there's more to that, right? Like the, the apps are doing a lot that are not covered by these three things. And the real juicy vulnerabilities and the real juicy bug bounties are in modifying the behavior of the app itself. So this is where Frida comes in. Frida is a 
is a framework for what they call instrumentation of running code. And so it's a, it's a very complex, low-level kind of conglomeration of other projects that are put together so that you can actually talk to the running app in memory. And so we can do all kinds of stuff with it. The first one that everybody normally bumps their head against is SSL certificate pinning. This is something that is huge on both Android and iOS right now, and it is one of the best protections if you're on the blue development side against the first two kind of attack paths in mobile apps, right? So certificate pinning tells that app that I'm only ever gonna use this specific certificate that I got on this, for this server that I'm talking to for my API. So when you try to add the burp suite CA so that you can do your traffic analysis, it just ignores it. And you get in all these SSL errors in burp suite and you're not seeing the traffic. So if this is something that you've been stuck on now, Frida can definitely help with this, right? So there's a lot of other things that we can do in there. Changing methods and changing configuration items, trying to get AES keys, things like that out. Um, all of this is possible. So, how does it work? Frida has two primary modes of operation, and you kind of have to be aware of these when you're, when you're doing whatever task you're working on. Interceptor and Stalker. So, Interceptor actually takes the live assembly code that's running in memory and puts in a trampoline. Who knows what a, an assembly trampoline is? So, it will, it will inject new assembly into memory to tell the program execution to go to a different path, right? So it, it's going to a new code location in memory that we can control, we can monitor, and we can um, do whatever we want with, essentially. So this is, this is very noisy. It's when you have things like jailbreak detection and when you have things like uh, game anti-cheat detection, um, interceptor is easier to detect, right? It's uh, also fun to watch. Um, <laughs> so the more stealthy version is Stalker, right? So what, what Stalker does is it takes a copy of the running assembly in memory, plops it over to a new section, and then it can follow the path and watch what it's doing sort of passively without affecting the live running application. So using this, you can watch the methods that are being called as the program, as the app executes. So you'll get, you'll get printouts of what method just got called with what parameters and what the response was. And this is part of the reverse engineering process when you're just kind of trying to figure out what the heck is going on inside this stupid app because I want to get free cheats on Clash of Clans. So you need to find the names of the methods because you, because you can't alter them until you know what it's called or you know where it's running in memory. So Stalker's a lot of fun to work with. It's a little bit more experimental um, and it has problems because obviously running live running assembly takes multiple directions, right? It's not just a straight path from beginning to end of the running app. So once you get to a junction point in the code, Stalker has to kind of stop redo things, usually burst into flames, and you start all over. So it's a little bit experimental, but it's a lot of fun to play with. So to sum that up, we can do a lot. We can change almost any running feature of an app on Android or iOS. It takes a little bit of effort, effort to get to that point because you have to do the RE and maybe do some static code analysis to find the names of methods, um, but you can do a lot. So to get to that point, it's a little bit of a bear to set up, especially if you're doing this for the first time on some mobile devices, right? So you've gotta have a, a workstation, a laptop, and it requires Python. So they just upgraded to Python 3. However, many of the tools that are built on Frida are still using Python 2. So if you learn one thing in this talk, it's virtual environment, right? Virtual environment sends a sandbox aside with whatever name you give it, so that when you install the dependencies for that tool, it's in the sandbox, and when you install the dependencies for a different tool, it's in a different sandbox. So they don't crosstalk, you won't have dependency problems, 
And when you do have problems and things blow up, you can blow away the sandbox and not have to uninstall Python and all the dependencies from your workstation. Once you get past that point, pip, um, the free to command line tools are separate now, so you have to do it on two different projects, but you know, it's just five minutes. Android Studio and Xcode are required depending on what mobile device you want to work with. Right? So if you don't do a lot of mobile development, you just want to do hacking, these are interesting, right? Android Studio is much more friendly than Xcode, right? And Xcode command line tools is now a separate download that you have to go out to Apple site to discover on your own. So you can target almost any, or you can, I'm sorry, you can run it from any platform through the magic of Python, and you can target binaries from any of these. So Frida's not just good for mobile. You can use it for x86, x64. There's now a, a MIPS port, like it's ARM, it's everywhere. Who can tell me what QNX is? Yes. What? Who runs it though? Where, where would you see it live in the real world? Uh, registers. Um, Ford Sync 3. Is that possible? Maybe, I don't know. Is it? Yeah. Blackberries is what I was going to say. Yeah. Blackberry is like the main user of QNIX. So, since we're here for mobile stuff, I'm going to start covering Android, right? So, it's a little bit more friendly on Android. You just go out to GitHub and um, find the specific Frida server binary for your architecture. Now, you have to pay attention to your architecture. Everything is basically going to ARM64, but it's not there yet. And if you get a newer phone on both iOS and Android, you might not be able to do the jailbreaks and the roots that you want to do. So, like I do, you're going to drop back and get a $50 phone off eBay, and it might be ARM32, right? So just pay attention to that. Um, once you get to that point, you can use ADB, which is the little utility that's installed with Android Studio, and it's like Android Debug Bridge, I think. And you just you push it up to a friendly location where you can um, chmod it to being ex executable and run it. And the free-to-server binary is, is now running and listening on some TCP port. And so when you're, whether you're connecting over USB or whether you're connecting over TCP, you can talk to the server who's making all the magic happen. All right, oh, there you go, executing it. Um, if you don't know Unix, the ampersand just means run it in the background so I don't have to watch the output. You, you're not going to get a ton of debug output even when things are blowing up just because of the, the nature of the way it runs. You can do like um, ADB logcat and that will show you all the logs that are happening on the device and it's a lot so you just kind of have to go back and forth. On a jailbroken iPhone, um, most people are going to have Cydia and so then you just install it through the Cydia. You have to add the, the package repository and go in and get the latest one. Now, because you're relying on someone else to, up, to upload the latest package to the Cydia repo, it can be a little bit delayed. Even just developing this talk over the span of two months, um, they went through six or eight revisions of the Frida, of the Frida um, binary. So you have to wait a few days now. He's really fast, and I think it's mostly automated, but you might have to wait a day to get a new version. And I, I did run into problems where the version that I had was not running um, on my version of phone. If you're a little bit more advanced, you can just run it from straight apt on iOS. Um, and you want to install the latest. So you can do this on non-jailbroken, non-rooted devices as well. It is not a trivial task. If you've never done app compilation on mobile devices before, it's even worse to try and recompile somebody else's app. So um, with Apple, you have to have a developer account. So you can, you can get a free developer account, or you can pay $99 for the professional version. With the free version, the caveat is the trusted profiles, the certificates that you're using for your recompiled app are only good for like seven or 10 days. And so you're redoing that every 10 days. For me, it was the $99 was cheap enough that I could just avoid the hassle of having to, you know, like I, I do it a week later and nothing's running and I can't figure out why. And I'm like, oh, my stupid app certificate expired. 
So then you have to set up deployment profiles and do you know all the recom recompilation process. So it's it's not difficult. The first time you do it, it's time consuming, consuming and non-trivial, but it is possible. If you cannot get a jailbroken phone, which is tough right now, right? Like I have a, a jailbroken iPhone 6 running 11.3.1, which is very old now, but I waited with that version, that phone doing nothing for three or four months because I knew there was a jailbreak coming for that version. So I just shut it off and left it on my desk for three months and then prayed that it still worked when the jailbreak got there. And then, you know, it's like wizardry, however they do that. Once you can recompile the app with the, the free to gadget in it, then you're talking directly to the gadget inside of the app instead of the free to server. And so it can still do the things that it needs to do. Um, just a little bit more legwork on your part. So now you've got to the point where you've got this thing running on your mobile device and you've got this thing running on your laptop and you want to start doing <coughs> stuff, right? We're all here to do stuff. So just some basic smoke tests to make sure things are set up and running properly. Just make sure your devices are present, right? And this will actually show you the, the UID of those devices, whatever is plugged in through USB. I always do it over USB. The, the TCP version is just not as stable. Um, so you can see what devices are there. And if you have more than one hooked up, um, then you just have to add that UID on all the commands you use from the command line. But then it'll show you the, the running processes on the system through free to PS. Um, U is for USB, so you're going to see that on everything. And then free to trace will show you that app running right now in memory and everything it's doing. So when you put that asterisk in there, that's shit saying show me all of the methods that are getting called internal to this app. So it shows you not just the, like the public exports, but it shows you absolutely everything. And it, you know, it's just the waterfall of text on the screen. And when you hit control C, it takes eight minutes to stop. So you can actually start using other internal methods that are common for the, like the file system operations. So like if you're trying to look for it opening um, certificates or private keys or you know, anything on the file system, any kind of thing that might be in the secure storage that you want to be able to get access to, you can use open, send and receive is for network transmissions. Um, and you can actually change the, one of the examples um, is you can change the, the transmissions prior to like HTTPS encryption. So if you can't do your certificate pending and you want to modify the behavior, you can do it pre-encryption um, and kind of get the same effect. It's not nearly as easy as just watching it go through burp and you know, modifying parameters in there, but, but you can do it. Um, so at this point in most reverse engineering talks, <laughs> this is where we get to, right? Like it's, it's extremely difficult in an hour to give a full reverse engineering course, okay? So we're, we're kind of at step 1.1 right now, right? So I'm gonna try to show some, some less basic operations that can just get you started. Um, we unfortunately don't have a lot of time for real demos, but we'll see where we get. So this is the second most important thing to take note of in this talk, the no pause. So it's operating sort of like a debugger. When you start Frida up and it either attaches to a running app or, or spawns an app to run, it's gonna sit there and wait and blink at you until you do something, okay? What this is doing is this is giving Frida time if you're loading a script, and we'll get to scripting later, it's giving Frida time to load that script into memory and start doing the, the pre-spawning um, operations that you want to do. If you do no pause, then it doesn't do that wait, and it starts up, and then you can just start actually typing and interacting with the running app. And you'll see it pop up on your phone, um, and if, if you're doing SSL pending, this is where it will either work or it will fail. Right. So the process is literally the process that's running on the, on the device. So you can start enumerating all of, the, all of the methods, all of the symbols that are exported, 
and you can start getting names of things. And when you do this, let's see if this works. When you do this, you're getting actual live running memory locations. So if we're talking about spawning apps and getting live memory locations, somebody yell out, what about ASLR? So does ASLR affect where we're trying to find the apps that are now running in memory? So if it's compiled in the app, which just doesn't very ha happen very often, ASLR does not come into play because we're spawning it natively or we're injecting into it already running in memory. So we don't need to try and guess where it's <coughs> going to be running like a, like a Windows exploit that we're sending someone um, because it's already there. We're just looking inside of it because we already have you know, root permissions or whatever we need. So, oops, VE activate, is that tiny? That is tiny. So VE activate is a, um, just a wrapper script I have around virtual environments so I can say VE activate Frida, right? And it drops me into that sandbox that I was talking about. That's not going to work. Let's go back over here. So, so we can start enumerating things that are in the running process. So when this happens, how many of you have ever done any kind of mobile development? A little bit. So how many of you have ever done any kind of any development? Right? When you sit down to write any kind of app, do you write every line of code on your own? Or do you use frameworks and libraries and things that exist, right? So when you do these enumerations, you get a list of like a billion modules that are all in the, the libraries that come from Apple or Google. And you got to find the ones you're looking for. Because in this, in this list of several thousand modules in there, there might be like three for the app that you're attacking. And so I'll just copy that out into Sublime or something and scroll through there and literally just, you know, the app what they call the modules don't always match what the running app is called because that's just a display name, right? They don't actually call it Clash of Clans in the code. So you just poke and find and scratch through there until you think you find something. Um, and then you can go in there and start trying to find the base address, right? And this will give you the actual running memory location so that you can start modifying things. So like in the scripts we'll come to later, you'll see memory pointers and then you have to deal with offsets. And so this is where we start getting into trying to do that owl, right? Like it's hard to talk about pointers and offsets in a, in a one hour class, but just understand that once you have the base address for the running application, everything is built off that. So maybe if you do have Ida Pro or you got good at like we're there, you can find that this function is at base plus whatever, and then you can start messing around in there. So everything in Frida is scriptable, and they have, they have bindings for, I think, C Sharp, Node, and JavaScript, and C. Maybe not C Sharp. C, JavaScript, and Node. So any of those three languages, and Python, any of those four languages can be scripted in order to call Frida directly and make direct API calls to do the exact same things that you probably would never really do on the command line, right? I always start with the command line as I'm just starting to poke around and see what's inside this app, but then you're going to pull it out and, and do some scripts. Right, so all you're doing there is you're saying that wizard guy that was in the beginning, he wrote a script, and I want to load that. Um, and so they can be super simple. Like this one right here is doing that, um, the, it's changing the, the send method that I was showing earlier in the trace, right? So we can send different messages um, with just this size of script. Now, obviously, this is super basic, and you're not going to do this on a real app, but it doesn't have to be super complicated. And the documentation for the Frida API is huge, and it's all online. So if you get stuck on one, one point, it's, it's pretty easy to find. Um, the other thing is, the free to code share has tons of other scripts out there. And so like if you don't really want to try and write your own SSL pinning bypass script, you can just go out to the code share and 
find one of the eight that are already out there and find one that works for you, right? I, I do that a lot just because, you know, as you're going through this, like some tools may or may not work depending on which version of iOS, which version of Frida, which architecture you're on, and how old is the code that is in that script. And so you poke through there and I'll just copy pieces out and you know, kind of edit my own. And there's always the github.com. There are, I have a bunch of links at the end in these slides, but there's a billion projects out there on GitHub that all make use of Frida for doing the types of things you want to do to hack apps. So, yes. So can you call application methods within the scripts or? Yes. Yep, you can actually directly inject into the running application methods and, and modify, so like swizzling for lack of a better word, um, modify that one single specific method. So like say if it's um, a common one, and I always come back to this because it's such a pain, is certificate pinning. There are some very commonly known certificate pinning libraries or like certificate pinning methods on iOS, but the developers don't have to use those ones. They can name it something else to get around us, and you, if you go in there and you discover the name of that method, then you can change that specific method to say true instead of false when it when it returns after the certificate check. And can you change the, I guess, I don't know, it's called the execution register, like where the next executing instruction is, or can you only change? Um, so it, it's not like a debugger where you would go register specific, um, it's more, it's abstracted one layer. So you don't, um, you, can, you can do direct pointer math, and I think the answer is yes, because you can actually go through with, especially with the C bindings, they're a lot lower level, so you can go through and do direct pointer math. I'm not sure if you can change like the execution register to get outside of your memory space or anything. Yeah, I guess my question was like, if you're in there and you're like, okay, well this method's about to be executed next, but I wanna skip it, or like I wanna go to this one instead, if that's possible. So it's a little bit different of a mindset where you wouldn't change the register to skip the method. You would just blank that method out. And so it doesn't exist anymore or it does something that you want it to do, right? You could just tell it return, you know? Or redirect. Or, or redirect, or yeah. Something like that. So now we're at the point where we're starting to build our owl, right? And that was up there for a long time. So <laughs> um, if you, once you get to this point, how am I on time? Once you get to this point, um, you're starting to change the way that the, the application behaves for real, right? So not only certificate pending and not only you know, bypassing um, other types of authorization and authentication checks, but you can go in there and start changing the everything else. So like I like to mess around with games, right? I wanna cheat on games. So you can start finding things where you can get free money. And I don't necessarily go for like dollar money because I don't like prison, but um, you can find, you know, the in-game money and stuff like that so that you can just cheat on games. Um, oh, my screen just disappeared. There we go. So, if you're doing this... Is that coming back? Yeah. Womp womp. So if you're doing this professionally, you're probably not going to be doing Frida at the command line. Um, I specifically, I get a week per app, right? And so a week is not enough to do these types of operations. I have no idea what just happened to the, to the view here. Um, a week is not enough to go through these types of reverse engineering to get the information that you need in order to, to find vulnerabilities, right? This is something that if you have an app that you hate, um, then you can sit and pick it apart or maybe on some bug bounties, then it's uh, much more realistic that you can sit there for a month and work on one app. This totally just blew up. There we go. So there's some apps that I like to use. Now, Android 
is always a little bit more of the wild, wild west, right? Like iPhone is very nice and controlled and everything works very well as long as you pay attention to the specific versions of phone and iOS and whatever jailbreak you may be running. Fios is one of the best tools I've ever used for mobile testing, right? It's literally just plug and play and you get all that information about um, certificate bypass and configuration analysis and you get all that super easy but it doesn't work right now on my 11.3.1, right? So I've been testing literally all of these tools and they're all based on Frida. So Frick is a little bit different. It's a little bit closer to the, to the debugger world. So it, it looks kind of like Radar. Um, so when you start it up, it's expecting you to start giving commands to, you know, to analyze and decompile the app and do things like that but it's, it's lower level and, and super powerful. It's just a little bit higher of a learning curve. Um, R2 Frida, I really want to get better at R2, but it's the highest learning curve of them all. Um, but so there's a Frida module, so if you're good with, with Radar, then you can just get in and use the R2 Frida module to, to talk directly to the phones. Um, Objection is another good one, and Objection is the one I probably use the most these days because they stay most up to date because it's an actual company. It's put out by SensePost, so they actually have people who get paid to keep this stuff working because they use it internally, I guess. Um, so, you know, it's it's fairly good. And when I when I have a question about the way some script is running or more commonly not running, I'll go out and look at the Objection source because it's all on the GitHub, and and see what I need to do. Demo's not working. Just kidding. So, um, so the creator of Frida is this guy, and I can't pronounce his name. Um, but we are all, I just, you know, I have to throw that out because we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. So, Frida on Telegram is a pretty good resource for kind of learning, but it's like IRC in the 90s. And so, when you ask questions, um, you need to have done some homework first because there are a lot of people that just go in there and you know, tell me how to hack my Facebook app and it's not pretty. Um, free to on free note is basically just a mirror of the Telegram. Um, the secret Slack is pretty good. The guy who runs it um, actually does hacking on Clash of Clans and like has developed cheats and stuff like that. So I like hanging out <coughs> there. And iDevice Pwn is for um, jailbreaking. Those last two are really low volume um, so if you're not into the whole hanging out online for all night long thing, they're not so bad. So any questions? I know we moved kind of fast and didn't really get a really nice owl, but somebody asked me some questions. No? No more questions? I have one more thing. Yeah, go for it. So do you, uh, do you have to root bandwidth on for freedom? Yes. I, you don't have to, but I did. I guess um, my question would be, does Android have some concept of like uh, kernel memory and user memory, and if you're not reading it, how can you interject into the memory of another process? I, I think it does, um, and honestly, I've just never cared because it just works. yeah, because it just works, right? Like now, I, there's, everything in the mobile stuff here is always caveated, right? So. I left the company that I was working at before, so I had to give up my perfectly working mobile devices, send them back home, and I bought two new ones on eBay. So I bought an iPhone 6 and I bought a Pixel 1. The iPhone 6 is jailbroken now, and the Pixel 1 is rooted, um, but the bootloader is locked forever. And that's not a carrier-specific thing that comes from Google like that on some Pixels. So if you get a Pixel from like Vietnam, you can root it all day long. But if you buy a Pixel in America, the bootloader's locked, and so I can't do some of the things I need to do, like upload certificates to the certificate store to do pinning bypass. So I'm going back to eBay again to find another older, like I had really good luck with the, the Nexus 6. Yep, the Nexus 6 is very rootable, so, and you can pick them up on eBay for, I don't know, like 50 bucks or something now. <laughs> There's no point in holding it up, it's just a black rectangle. <laughs> so, any other questions about anything? Getting set up? Hacking the apps? No? All right, well, thanks everybody. Sorry I didn't have a good working demo, but such is life. <laughs>